There we go. Okay, folks, here we are with the February 2021 uh, author virtual author meetup for the 815 author group. This month, backed by popular demand because we had so many viewers last month, we've got Heath B. Alberts and myself. Hey, Heath. Hi. How are you? Um, good. How you doing, buddy? I'm all right. I'm waking up. <laughs> You're ahead of me then. Um, so I guess what I want to do, again, is explain sort of what the 815 author group is. Um, it is a group of authors who are located in the general Rockford area. We've got people as far out as Freeport, I think a couple people from the Chicago suburbs, uh, Dan Klefstad's down in DeKalb. So the general area. And um, the idea is that as a group, we can work together and uh, help to cross promote stuff and um, just generally put things together to uh, I don't know, get some interest out there and, and also to support one another. Um, you know, if people have questions or looking for collaborators or whatever. And so that's that's the idea of the group. Um, now, last week, last month, sorry, not last week, we uh, sort of threw the our links out at the end, almost as an afterthought. Why don't we just get those out at the head of the thing this time? Uh, Heath, why don't you give us your where people can find more information on your stuff. Uh, the easiest place uh, is heathdalberts.com. So basically what you see at the bottom of your screen without the period and .com. Cool. Okay. <laughs> For me, we've got uh, uh, garyhillauthor.com, um, also musicstreetjournal.com, and spookyventures.com. And there are all kinds of links to YouTube channels and bookstores and things from there. So uh, now with that in mind, and since we've already been talking about the 815 author group, one, we, this, we're going to do things a little differently this month. Uh, Heath and I sort of talked about it. And we're just going to have, have a couple topics to sort of talk about. Um, we may wind up going as long as last time. We may have a shorter event. I don't know. And if we come up with other stuff, knowing Heath and I, we're probably going to wander off on other things anyway. But um, the first topic I wanted to talk about, which ties in pretty well with the 815 author group, is the Rockford area art scene in general, with all forms of arts, from music to visual art to um, the literature and all that. And um, kind of, I think both of us have probably have some insights into what the whole scene is like, and maybe some of the, the problems we see with the scene and things like that. So why don't you give us your insights on it, Heath? So I, back when I was doing um, Four City Stories, which was the second anthology of Rockford authors, either Rockford born or Rockford, uh, people who have lived in Rockford, I tried to make it Rockford centric to bring um, people's voices in that might otherwise be heard or published. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to do an event, uh, thanks to Kathy Kressel, check her stuff out. She's amazing too. Uh, at the Rockford Public Library and uh, Jenny Matthews, uh, who is a Rockford artist who's very well known in the Rockford area as a muralist, as an artist. She's very talented at cross platforms. Um, she said, you know, I'd like to speak. I also never heard Jenny speak before. And one of the things that still sticks with me to this day um, is here's this amazingly talented person who uplifts other artists and she got up there and made this passionate speech and I wish it had been recorded, it was so good. And she said, Rockford is a city that once was all of these things, but isn't those things anymore. And yet when all of the, all of the industry and all of the money and all of the things move away, very often the people that are left behind are what she called the makers, the people that create inspirational works that don't necessarily make a lot of money and she said rockford has become a city of makers and the beautiful thing about that is that they nurture one another and i was just so blown away by that concept and so one of the things i didn't understand or realize until probably about a year and a half ago when i really got involved with it more is how um how uplifting the Rockford art scene is and how uplifting the Rockford music scene is. They have created something that is, um, is enviable and is envied by people in that um, 
There is the Rockford Area Arts Council. There's the Rockford Art Museum. There's the 317 Gallery. There's, um, I can't think of, uh, oh, the Courtman, J.R. Courtman Gallery. And there are all these little music venues. And what surprised me was is how much musicians and artists tended to kind of merge. They, they, they hang out together a lot. And so if an artist likes a local musician, they say, hey, check out this local musician. And that local musician say, hey, check out this artist. And I've watched collaborations happen. And so there's this really almost organic network of artists in Rockford that is just, it's a profound thing to watch. All these people uplift one another and to create all this beautiful stuff. And I think, I think from what I've seen, a lot of people just don't know it's there. And I really can't encourage you strongly enough um, if you have the opportunity to go to a gallery opening or go to a show opening um, or go to a music event. Um, there's a lot of really good local bands. Um, yeah, it's just, it was, so a side story, um, <laughs> go off on a tangent here. Um, I got introduced through uh, my friend Melinda to a guy named Michael White, who is, uh, he has a band called the Blue Healers. Never heard them before. And oh my God, they're amazing. Check them out if you ever get a chance. And so I was invited to a little, just kind of an outdoor gathering one night. And I'm uh, there was a band back in the early 90s. Um, there was a bunch of guys from Logley called uh, Logley Grocery Store. That's now no longer Logley. Uh, they were called Indian Opie. And my friend Wes got me into them. And I had this cassette and I just, I played it ad nauseum. And so... I'm listening to the conversation around me. I don't really know any of these people. And I hear somebody say Indian Opie. I'm like, well, there's something I didn't expect to hear. And so I say, oh, I'm like, man, you know what? I Did you say Indian Opie? I, I really like that band. And this guy next to me goes, oh, yeah, which song did you like? And I'm like, uh, My Aching Heart. That song was so great. I just played it over and over and over again. And Michael goes, yeah, I think we recorded that in like 48 hours straight. And we, we just stayed up. And I'm like, wait, you recorded that? He's like, yeah, I'm around Shackle Records. That's me. I'm like, I had no idea. I just, I, I'm sitting next to this guy and the guy, the guy who asked goes, yeah, he goes, that was a fun, that was a fun album to do. I go, oh, you were there? He goes, well, I played bass on it. I'm like, okay. Well, it turned in, he, he had flown in from Seattle for like a weekend and it was the first time he'd been back in Rockford forever. And somehow I found myself sitting next to him at a dinner party with the guy that recorded the album. And it's just, it's just stuff like that that just happens in Rockford. And it's just, it's so cool when that kind of stuff happens, but you have to be there to experience it. Again, a complete aside, but it's, to me, it's a fun story. Yeah, and I, I know Michael. Michael's a good guy. Yeah, he's, he's a, a super guy. guy. And he's done he's done a ton of great music over the years, too, that I think largely, unless you know it's him, you don't know that he even did it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I had a cassette, I had a cassette of another thing he did, and I used to love to listen to that, and I... When I when I wound up meeting him in person years later, I didn't even realize it was him until after I'd met him, um, which is kind of a trip, you know. We were we just had some mutual friends, so that was how we wound up meeting. But yeah, and, and you know what I think? What I think? Well, you were talking about how the musicians and artists and all sort of intermingle and stuff. I think that's sort of there's a lot of um, artistic expression is not often, sometimes not limited to one thing for people. Like, you know, I've done music, I've done writing, I've done photography. Uh, years and years ago, I used to do um, pencil, you know, drawings and stuff like that. Well, really? I never knew that about you. Yeah, that, but I, get, I sort of quit doing that, I don't know, when I got into my teens, but I used to draw comic books all the time when I was a kid. And um, I sort of think that a lot of people who are artistic – it, it's not limited to one form of expression. They tend to find that they're better at one thing or they have more practice at it so they get better at it. But um, I think that they tend to be able to do other things and they gravitate towards other people who create like that. Um, one of the sad things I think about Rockford, Rockford's art scene is incredibly vibrant. There are so many great people out there creating so many things. But I think largely it's uh, overlooked and almost mm -hmm. um, almost intentionally ignored by the powers that be in the town. Um, I remember. I think, a I think that's changing. Community. What's that? I think that's changing though. Please go on. Maybe, but I remember years ago there was a friend of mine, 
And, and I think some of it is just they don't get it because there was a friend of mine who was on a committee who was looking at things to do to improve Rockford, right? And um, they were talking about taking some of these old buildings downtown and developing them into um, living spaces with uh, galleries underneath for artists, which is a brilliant idea, right? The problem was, and my friend pointed this out, the problem was they were wanting to make them into these luxury condo kind of things that were going to be way out of the budget for your average artist. I mean, right. start artist. Right. Then, there's, there's something we said for the term starving artist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's legitimate. You don't often make a lot of money at art. And certainly these people aren't going to be looking to invest huge amounts of money into these massive um, rents, which at the time were like way beyond what an average rent was. Right. And it's like, you're going to market these to artists. I don't think you're, I think you're missing the point. <laughs> so I think a lot of times the city, and I mean, the city has gone through and when there've been mu uh, music venues, they've gone through and made it really, really hard on those music venues to keep operating, especially ones that did things that were outside of the norm, like punk rock venues. Um, there have been several of those and the city would just come down and go after them over and over and over again for code violations. Now, don't really? get me wrong. Code violations are important. You right. need to have safe buildings and things like that. But sometimes it seems almost more like harassment to get somebody out of business that they just don't like. And um, I think certain scenes they didn't necessarily approve of. So they had a tendency to go after them. And I think that's a shame because you can have all these chain stores you want. Every city has the same chain stores. What makes a city special is the art community. You know, it's like I always say with, when people are asking me about getting into writing, I always say, well, the one thing to always remember, you're the only one who can tell your story. The mechanics and stuff of it, that's just what you have to learn to get it out there, but it's your story and only you can tell it the right way. And it's the same thing with art. Each person, has their own art and they're the only one who can do that. And every city has their own group of those people and it's going to be unique. That's what makes a town unique, not a bunch of chain stores, you know? No, I do. I do know. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of ashamed of myself that I didn't, I didn't realize how strong and vibrant it was until I, I, I kicked myself out of my own comfort zone and I wish I had done it sooner. And I wish, I mean, I, since then, I've been a, a huge vocal proponent for the art scene, for the music scene. Just, you know, get out and do the thing. Go there. Just try it. Um, it might not be your cup of tea, but keep trying anyway. The other thing that's really beautiful about it is, so I'm, I'm a social chameleon, but in a good way. I don't do it to, you know, try and, and, and gain things or to be um, disingenuous. I'm a social chameleon in that, I want to try everything and I want to know how everybody thinks. And so I will listen to a Christian. I will listen to an atheist because I want to know how they think. It's interesting to me because everybody's viewpoints are so different. And one of the, the coolest things about the Rockford art scene is there you will meet people with piercings and tattoos who look really scary, who are the nicest people you will ever meet. And you will meet people that dress in really expensive clothing and you think, oh, they're so aloof. No, they're just, they're just people. They're just, and they can be really nice too. And these people are in the same room together talking to one another. I mean, where else do you see that? That's just, that's so, it's so amazing. And I think it helps to, to humanize so many people and to ruin so many stereotypes in such a positive way. And I think, I think the art community just crushes that. I mean, they just hit it with a wrecking ball and it's beautiful. And I don't think people realize how how eye-opening and mind-altering that can be to just the life you live. Um, it, it, I, to me, it can actually make you a better person. It can give you a better life to, to be more open-minded and, and to meet more people. And I think it's a poverty that I didn't do that before because I, I very I very often felt like I didn't belong there. And everybody belongs there. That's the reality. Art is for everyone. You may not agree with it. You may not like it. You may not understand it. But it's there if you choose to to like it. Um, it's, yeah, it, it you're, not gonna, you're not going to like every piece of art you see or the oh, absolutely art not. you see by any means, no. but that you're not supposed to. People don't put it out there for everybody to like it. They put it out it's, there. It's for subjective. The yeah. And some people will get it and some won't. One you of the know? things um, I, I, I have found that's been, I think if there's any disappointment that I've had is that 
writers in that scene don't seem to be included. It's not as though they're excluded, but I kept looking around and thinking, okay, you know, maybe there'll be, I realize it's not traditional art. When you go to an art gallery and you see stuff on the walls and it's, it's, it's mixed media or it's macrame or it's photography and you see musicians there. And I, I kept looking around going, where are the writers? Where are the books? Where are the authors? And if one thing could change, um, you, you'd ask me what I thought. Um, I forgot how you worded it, but it's something that, uh, that I would like to see change about it or that I'd like to see made better. And that would be find a way to include writers. Um, that would be, that would be really, if I would like to see somebody, I would love to see 317 take up the mantle and just have a, a wall of Rockford authors books, because I don't think people realize how many authors are around. I don't think people realize yeah. how many great authors are in Rockford. Well, you know, you remember, I'm sure you remember last year, before the whole pandemic hit and everything shut down, I was actually looking to put together something like that. Now, I didn't talk to a lot of people about it, but I know I talked to you about it, where I was looking to put together an author signing event and have artists having their stuff on display and have at least one musician playing. Um, and, you know, what whatever forms of art we could get in there and have it represent a lot of different forms of Rockford art. Mm -hmm. And I still like to do that. Once this is all over, we're looking at probably next year before I'd be comfortable doing it. But sure. I'd still like to put together something like that. I think it would be great. Um, and who knows, maybe we can get some more people involved between now and then and really make it some kind of an event, do a couple of them a year or something. That would be a really cool thing, I think. Because yeah. one of the things I like about the 815 author group, and I like about any kind of arts group like that, is if somebody comes to see me and see my stuff and you've got your stuff there, they might suddenly find your stuff that they hadn't heard about before and vice versa. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Somebody might come in looking for somebody's artwork and come across one of our books and decide, Hey, this is really cool. I never heard of this. Or they might listen to the musician playing and say, Hey, I want to get a CD of that. That's really good. Right. Um, so I think that that sort of, by having, you know, you've got people who are interested in arts who come to those things and it allows them to be exposed to stuff they otherwise might not have ever heard because it mm -hmm. increases the exposure of everything. And it also helps people network. And I, I know you've done it. I've done it. I'm huge on collaborating with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a writer, it's hard, but you, you've done collection books. I've done collection books. And I like to do anything I can to collaborate with people because I think that that's how, you know, you can create a certain amount of art to yourself, but when you bring in other people, it brings in other voices, it brings in other viewpoints, other backgrounds, and it sort of makes it, uh, it makes it greater. It's like the sum of all parts is that is, you know, the sum is greater than the, the adding up all the parts. And We're starting to juxtapose audiences. Yeah, and I think it's just, I think it's very true that it would allow more networking, which would allow for more collaboration. And I would really like to see that once we come out of this pandemic, I would really like to see people from various arts in Rockford start working together at goals like that, because I think we could do something with it. And if anybody can get the city government or the uh, Rock River Valley, what is it, the Visitors Bureau or whatever, Tourism Bureau involved with it. Um, re the Ramy Commission, if we can, if we get musicians in there, maybe we can get them involved. But if we can get some of those people involved and use some of their networking and stuff, we could really turn this into something really cool, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Sort of a cross cross medium art sort of thing. I call it cross pollinating. Yeah, that's that's what I call it. Um, it's just the word yeah. I, 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 I've chosen. One of the things I think you know, you talk, you, you hit on a really good point and it makes it where authors really don't have a leg up is when I walk into an art gallery, I look around, I look around, I look around. And sometimes one piece of art just smacks me in the face, but it's, it's, it, it's instantaneous because I can see everything right there. What, same thing when I'm hearing music, I'm hearing music. Oh, I really like that song with a writer. It's different because you, all you see is a book cover. You see a book right. cover and a title, and okay, what is this about? Oh, it's about this and this and this and this. Well, what about that one? Oh, it's about this and this and this. And this. So it's more, much more labor intensive, and it's much less um, 
viscerally stimulating in a, in a visual or an audible way. And I think that's where, that's where it makes it really, really easy to not include authors. And it makes it really, really easy to dismiss them because they don't have that, they don't have that leg up. They just don't. It's just, it's, it's the nature of the beast. Even people that make really, you know, really quality handmade furniture, you can walk and look at that furniture and size it up very quickly and you have an impulsive reaction to it. Um, whereas a book, you have no idea what it's about until you read the back. Right. And, and so that, that's part of the problem. One, one other thing I wanted to bring up, just completely forgot an entire form of art that's viable and, and, and vibrant in Rockford, filmmaking. There are a lot of independent oh, filmmakers too. And I do not want to ignore them. We, and, I, and if we get doing this, I'd like to have some filmmakers in there too, perhaps screening some of their stuff, having DVDs for sale or Blu-rays or whatever they've got. Um, oh, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, because there are a lot of really good independent film rate makers. Uh, Travis Legg is out of it now, but he's put out some really cool movies. Um, and I know there are plenty of others in the area too. So we would want to include them as well. That's, I know I never even thought about that. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a dear friend, Alyssa, who um, does a lot of acting in shorts. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name and Belight that does them, but they're really, really funny. They're really, really well done. So yeah, that, that would actually be really cool. You really got my, you really got my wheels spinning now here now that we're talking about this. Um, it's kind of well, like, uh, it's, it's like a, like a, like an artist show or a craft fair, but kind of all mixed together. That, that, yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. And last year, I, when I started doing it last year, it was going to be very rushed to put it together. Maybe if we start working on it and collaborating and getting things ready to do something for spring of next year, um, we'd have plenty of time to really coordinate and figure everything out without actually rushing anything. And we could put something really good together. I, I think we'll look into that. I'm, I'm game to look into that. Yeah. And anybody exactly. watching this who wants to contribute, please get in touch. Yeah, I'm thinking, I, I think a couple of cool venues might be like, um, I don't know if you've ever been down to Scavenge Parts by the airport. It's uh, Sarah Thistle's place. She yeah. does um, she does furniture reclamation and she sells kind of odd and quirky and weird stuff. And she's, she has a lot of space down there. And they actually do, um, she and her friends will do film screenings down there and things like that. She actually has a really good venue for it. So now I'm, I'm kind of thinking about maybe talking to her. I, I think that would be almost a perfect place for it because then it would gain more visibility for her venue that a lot of people don't even know is there. Plus, she has a lot of space that she can use, and so it would be kind of a be a win-win sort of a thing. Well, when yeah. this when this goes, uh, the video of this is archived on there. Be sure and tag her if she's on Facebook. I might. Yeah, yeah. she is. Yeah, uh, I can tell you, I'm going to be tagging everybody we've mentioned too. So, sure, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that. So, I like that a lot. I, 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 on this whole okay. set, on this subject. Say again. Any other things you want to add on this subject? Um, the, the only the, the last thought I would have is that I see so many people in Rockford pine for what it was. Oh, we were the manufacturing capital. Oh, we were the screw capital. Oh, we were the furniture capital. And to me, I really hope that the people that are pining for what, what for what once was can take that energy and turn it into pining for what we could be and what what is possible and what our assets are and how we can best use them. And I would encourage anybody that finds themselves in the prior camp to be proud of what Rockford was and be proud of what Rockford did and then put it to bed. Um, and think about what Rockford could be or what can, can what can happen here. And I think it'll be a better place if people think that way rather than the prior. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on that. And I think to some degree, the younger crew are going to be the people who are more into the what it can be and what it can what it is becoming. Um, I mean, it's cliche, but it's also true. Older people tend to link on to the things that were around when they were younger, and a lot of them are less likely to grab on to the newer things. Um, so Stereotypically, the, yes. And the more you can bring, I mean, there are exceptions to the rule, obviously. Well, absolutely. I'm certainly not one of those people, but um, 
I think the more we can bring younger people into it um, and get them involved in the process of working, with, putting things together and stuff, I think that would be benefit everything and everyone, you know, um, because they, they would have that energy and they have that optimism towards what can be. That's the other thing. As you get older, and this is everybody, I think, you do tend to get a little more calloused because you see the things that have been tried and failed. And it's easy to think, well, here we go again with this. And that's that's a hard thing to break because you've seen it enough times. And I think the younger people have an optimism because they haven't seen those failures so many times. They, they and, don't know that they can't. Right. And, and maybe they maybe they can. And no, no, no that's what I mean. They don't know that they can't. Right. And because of their commitment to it, it will help to propel it forward. So I think bringing younger people in is another very important factor. Um, I agree. You know, because us, us older guys, it, it's a little less, we're a little less, uh, I don't know, naive, I guess, but, but naive in a good way. We're, we're, we have, um, we're a little more callous about it and uh, cynical. cynical. And, there you go. And that's just sort of a, a factor of going through life and experiencing the things that life gives you, you know. I think so. Um, but bringing the youth in will be very helpful with that. Yeah. So... I guess that's pretty much it for that category. Um, unless you got anything else? No, I'm good with that one. Okay, the other thing we wanted, we said we were going to talk about is just sort of the process of going and of writing, of going from an idea to a finished product. Um, why don't you go first with that, Heath? So, first of all, I would encourage everyone to be brave. Um, Bravery comes in many forms, and sometimes bravery comes in the form of understanding that your story isn't terrible and your story isn't unreadable, and just because you're not an author doesn't mean you don't have a story to tell. And so um, the first thing I would say is if you if you want to be a writer, um, sit down and write something. With, with the first sentence, you are a writer. Congratulations, you've done it. Um, but I would encourage you to, to write every day um, or write as much as you can, even if it's not meant for the world. It, it's great practice. It helps you learn how to type. Um, and it creates um, new little pocket universes for yourself as you learn more words and you find more ways to say a thing. And as your story begins to take form, um, don't discount it. Um, understand that not every writer was a success right off the bat. Um, and this, uh, the first thing you should probably talk about is whether you're a planner or a pantser. And we've touched on this before. So basically in, in the world of writing, there are two, two accepted dominant styles of writing. And one is a planner, which is the majority of writers. They will sit down and they will outline what their story is and what their idea is and how they get from point A to point B and what the major stepping stones are along the way. And then they'll kind of fill in the blanks. Being a pantser is a little more lazy, but it's a lot more fun, I think. And that's what I am. I'm a pantser. I've, I don't think I've ever written a book that's ever ended the way I thought it was going to end because it just it kind of takes a life of its own as you write it. And the downside is, is you, can, you can write yourself into a corner, um, which I have done a lot of times. And it is maddening when that happens because you're so far into the work you find yourself written into this corner, you say, okay, I need to get out of this or the book isn't going to be what it ought to be. But sometimes it's difficult to do that. Um, so decide whether you're a planner or a pantser. Um, write with just the intention of writing, even if no one sees it. Um, and as you develop your story and as you write your story, understand that it doesn't have to have chapters and it doesn't have to be written in a certain way. It has to be written the way you want to write it. And people have written people have written books in the second person. And that's a real thing. And everybody said, well, you can't do that. Well, of course you can. Um, Ernest Wright wrote a book without the letter E. 50,000 words without the letter E. It's called Gadsby. And he wrote it because, and I've talked about this before too, because somebody at a cocktail party told me he couldn't. Well, well, challenge accepted. He did it. And it's, it's become famous in its, in its life as it's gone on. It's more famous now than it's ever been. Um, 
but take those take those leaps and and write the book for yourself write something that you enjoy write something that makes you happy and as it develops i would encourage you to um, if you find yourself using a word over and over again um, hit the thesaurus find another word um, that's more interesting or that's more unique or that gives somebody pause or maybe is even more spot on um, that will be helpful um, i would encourage you once the book is ready it's done in your mind um, if you're fortunate enough to have some open-minded friends um, i would encourage you to have them read it and give their feedback and understand that they may not like it but that doesn't mean you have to listen to their feedback it doesn't mean it's any less valid but you don't have to acknowledge it in a way that fundamentally changes your story um, i have had works that people have gushed about. I've had works that people said, I don't get it. And I had to be the judge of what to leave in and what to take out. And at the end of the day, I was and I own it. Um, but having those other viewpoints and opinions is really, really helpful. Um, having an editor, editing and writing are two different things. And having a really strong editor, if you can afford one, or if you have a friend that's really, really nice and you know, masochistic, <laughs> Um, it can take something good and turn it into something great without changing the the overarching story. It just it helps to cosmetically blend everything together much more strongly. So if, if you have that luxury or that opportunity, um, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, my second novel is a study in why you need an editor. Um, if I ever have the time, money, or, or impetus, I'm probably going to get that thing edited because it needs an editor. Um, and then, as far as as far as publishing goes, there are all sorts of options of publishing, and you can publish traditionally, um, and you will probably get rejected unless you have something that's very topical or very um, specifically golden. Um, and you look at people like J.K. Rowling, who. Um, whose current overt philosophies I don't espouse. Let me just say that right now. Um, but she was told over and over again, nobody wants another story about wizards. Or we don't want this. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, one of the most um, notable works um, probably ever published, was rejected, I think, 27 times. And um, it was almost given up on. And so it's... If, if you get a rejection, just understand it isn't a, a declaration of war against your work. It just means that that wasn't the right place to put it. That just wasn't the right home for it. And that doesn't mean it's bad. That doesn't mean it's unsaleable. It just means it wasn't the right home for it. And conversely, you can publish on your own. Um, the publishing tools that have come to the fore are are hugely helpful. And they're, they're very, very fairly straightforward, they're fairly user friendly, um, but know your limits. If you are really, really bad at word processing, if you're really bad at layout, if you're really bad at cover design, know your limits. Um, but I would also encourage you to try and overcome them. Um, you can publish a book from start to finish on your own and put it out in the world and if it succeeds, great. If it fails, it fails, but you've done it. And you've created something and you've, you've birthed it and long after you're gone, it'll still be there. Um, so for me, as glib as all that sounds, that's that's really the writing process. As a, as a pantser, I never know where it's going to take me. I have a general idea, and I just run with it. And, and I, that's, part, that's part of what makes it enjoyable for me. It's almost like a puzzle. Um, but you don't get to see the box, you know? Now, now you are, are kind of the opposite, actually. And you are wildly more talented when it comes to editing. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, you really are. You are a much better editor than I am. Well, thank you. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, the funny thing is I've done so many different kinds of writing, too. Um, you really It have. all depends on what you're doing. I, But I am sort of a hybrid between the planner and the pantser in that if I'm writing a piece, I usually come up with, like, well, let's just talk the fiction stuff first because that's what you were on. Um, with fiction, I tend to come up with an idea. And it's usually just a germ of an idea, just something that's like, well, that'd be kind of cool. And then I, I sit and think on it for a while and think, well, how do we get to that? And I come up with ideas of how it sort of gets to there. And then, well, what's going to make this more interesting? And so I have 
usually by the time I start actually writing it, well, I write in my head for a long time and I've got things all planned out and even down to words sometimes in my, in my brain way ahead of before I ever type anything in. But by the time I usually start typing something in, I've got the beginning and I've got the ending, but I don't have anything in between. I may know, I may know who the characters are and things like that, maybe an event or something, but I, I sort of let the storyteller itself be on that point. Um, the characters are going to be the characters. Um, they're going to have their own personalities, and those personalities are going to lead them in certain directions and get them to say certain things. Um, I, a lot of it goes back to when I used to run role-playing games a lot. And um, the way I would run a role-playing game, I know a lot of people will use those big modules. Like for D&D, they get those adventure modules, and they have the whole story written out. I never liked doing that. For me, I would have a basic concept, and I would build the whole world, and I'd let all the players run around in the world doing whatever they wanted to do. Um, and I'd know what where it was going to happen at different places at different times, but I didn't know what was going to happen because I didn't know what the characters were going to do. And I sort of look at fiction in the same way. These characters are going to do what they're going to do. Different things are going to happen at different times in different places. But the way it impacts those characters is going to be dependent on who those characters are and how they're interacting with each other. And so I, a lot of times, don't know how we get from point A to the end until it's, until it's happened. Um, and, and then what will happen, like once I have that all down, the basic premise, then I start looking at it and saying, well, this thing here could tie into here. And so I add some little connecting line here, or I think this character needs to be rounded out a little more. What kind of a little character building scene could I write in here? And can that tie into something else be important? Um, so I'm sort of in between the two concepts when it comes to fiction. Now, nonfiction, I've done a lot of nonfiction, and I've done several different types. I've done like content farm writing, and content farm writing you know what, if you need to make some money and you can write, do it. Don't do it because you like to write because it's, <laughs> not, it's not writing per se. I mean, what basically most of the time, there are a few different companies do things different ways, but generally you get a title for an article. And um, depending on the company, one of the companies that will remain nameless that I used to write for a lot um, would give you the title and they got their titles by looking at Google searches and whatever ones were searched for more like more often, they would take those and make them into titles Isn't and put them over for the writers to do. And you always had to have uh, sources and only certain sources were reliable sources. So what I would do is I would look at the title. I would look to see if I had sources I could find for it. And then I just do it as a research paper. But the funny thing with theirs were the work was, they would tell you what had to be in each paragraph, how many words had to be in each paragraph, how many sentences. And it was literally like paint by number, but with words. Um, you know, it, there wasn't much creativity there. Um, you just had to plug the words in. And that's it's not entertaining writing at all, but it, it did pay pretty well sometimes. Um, some of the other ones were a little less strict in terms of what words, but generally, it was always research papers. Oh, what are you doing, Winnie? I got a doggy coming over here. Um, but you got um, the other angle of it is, even for my other nonfiction stuff, it's still research papers. When I get an idea of, okay, I want to write on uh, spooky stuff in the Rockford area, right? So I just Google to get an idea for different possible stories. And um, when I get some ideas of, okay, now does it look like there's enough sources for this? Mm. And I look at the sources, okay, is there enough different information to take from different sources to come up with something that's unique? And then you just do it as a research paper, really. Um, and that's, that's how pretty much all my nonfiction is. Um, but, you know, and, and like I said, the fiction, I'm sort of between the pantser and the planner. Um, 
And, and like you were saying, though, everybody's got their own voice. They've got their own stories. And the thing I would suggest is grammar rules and um, spelling and things like that. That's Those are tools. The words are tools. Um, they help other people to parse what you're saying. I don't think anybody's ever um, bought a book because it was grammatically correct. They bought a book because they liked the story. We're, and... and Conversely, even if there are problems and mistakes in there, do your best to get rid of them. But even if there are, don't kill yourself over it. If the story's good enough, people are still going to read it, as long as they're not having to stumble over every sentence saying, what's this trying to say? Right. You know, they're going to go, oh, there's, a, there's a, com a comma missing here. I won't read this book. If the story's good enough, they'll read it. Um, <laughs> sorry. So okay. my suggestion is, Get as good as you can with the grammar and things like that, but don't worry too much about it. Go over things, proof it, edit it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I got a frog in my throat. In any event, um, what I would say is if you go through any book that's in a first printing, I don't care what publisher it's from. I don't care how many people have bought, are buying the book. I will bet you that if you look carefully enough, you're going to find a few typos in it. Maybe not a lot, yeah. but a few, yeah. even from the big companies. Yeah. They've got oh, yeah. people yeah. over it, but something's going to get past them. Mm -hmm. It's just human nature. You can't catch everything. No, and you're not wrong. No. By the time you get into third, second, third, fourth printing, sometimes they fix that stuff. But yeah, first printing now, you're going to catch stuff. I've never found a book that I couldn't find one in. So I, you know, don't kill yourself over that stuff. And don't think you can't write. You can learn it. You can learn anything. Mm -hmm. Just don't do it. And like you said, write, write, write every day, you know. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. I don't know. I, I got nothing else. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's so Terry Reed, who you and I both know, she writes uh, Paranormal Mysteries. Right. Uh, just a wonderful woman. And she's one of those rare individuals that uh, – as a as a small print publisher um, has made a living at it, which is really hard to do. You have to be really good to make a living at it. You have to be really you have to be really engaging and you have to build an audience that she has. And I'm so proud of her for that. Um, the downside of that is um, I, I think at times she said, you know, I really liked writing these, but after X amount of books, I kind of want to write something else, but now my fans expect me to write these things. And at that point you have to say, are you writing for you? Are you writing for a living? Are you writing for your fans? And you have to make that decision. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of authors get pigeonholed that way. And I think that it almost becomes like work. It's just not as fun anymore. And so if you ever find yourself saying, oh, well, gosh, I'm, I'm a mystery author. I can't possibly. Well, no, you can. You can do anything you'd like. Your following may not like it. They may not read it. But if you're writing for you, it doesn't matter. Um, exactly. But you, talk, you talk about typos. Somebody, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm on my video. Can I call you back? Thank you. All right. I don't know, man. I'll call you back. Okay. I like how he asks questions. But this is why I have a real phone for my parents, though, my father. Sorry about that. Um, but I, I, she just had a review left and it said, uh, well, I don't read any more of these because there were typos in it. I thought, yeah. what, a cruel, what a cruel thing to do. The story was good. And that was the other part of the review. The story was really good, but I won't read anymore because there were typos in it. Yeah, it's, they said, I saw that thing she posted. So they said something like, well, well, I can't that, yeah. this is a good book because it's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I once had a person, um, and I never, thought I, I, I never thought I would be defended by the public, but somebody posted, uh, well, my second novel again. I, I couldn't possibly read a book by a person who abuses hyphens the way he does. And somebody popped up and I, I, I did a little bit of due diligence to figure out, I don't know if they were an English professor or what. And somebody said, well, actually all these hyphens on the back are justified. So you just don't like that he uses them because they're, they're correct. So I, I thought that was just like, I don't know. I just wanted to hug that person virtually. because it was just so, nice. so yeah, you're going to, you're going to run into that. And that's one other thing too. Do not engage the trolls at all don't, ever ever even in your life just don't do it because if they are setting their mindset you are not going to win you're just going to make an enemy just just let them do what they're going to do if somebody wants to defend you great let them but don't let it be you 
it's just not worth it. No, and I've had I've had people, um, you know, on the other end of it because I do music reviews. I've had people who I've done, and the funny thing is, we don't do negative reviews. My my thought on it is, um, if I don't like something more than I dislike it, I'm not going to review it because there's so much stuff out there. Why should I waste my time and my readers' time on something bad when I could be writing about something good and promoting something good? And the other thing is. Nobody sets out to make a bad album or a bad song or a bad movie or a bad book. People come set out to make something that they want to make, and who am I to go trash that either? Um, so I well, it's subjective, right? Right, and I don't do negative reviews, but yet I've had people argue with me on reviews on little fine points in some of the reviews that I've made. I've had them get in touch with me and argue with me and fight with me about it, and it's like. Really? You're not going to, and I've always told them, look, it's my opinion. Find someone with another opinion. You know, they're all just, I don't care who the reviewer is. It's one person's opinion. Maybe I hear more music than a lot of people do. Maybe I have more stuff to compare it to, but it's still my opinion. You know, don't get so uptight about one person's opinion. Well, and, and as, a, as a reviewer, you're kind of the Sherpa. You, you are not telling them how to think as a reviewer you are someone who can act as a guide to take people to new places. Oh, I, I, I agree with Gary on these reviews. Let's see where else he goes that I would not otherwise go. Oh, he's guiding me to this place. Here are his thoughts on it. Let me, let me let me provide my own. I think that sounds interesting. You At that point, you're a guide. And I think people need right. to see you that way, not as you are not a, a, a dictator. No, and, and one, of, one of my points, too, with reviews is I'm less – I'm less about telling people whether something's good or bad because that's subjective. Right. What I try to do more often than not is describe what it is and say, well, if you like this, it's got these similarities to that. Right. And try to give them an idea. And a lot of that comes from literally when I was reading, I read a review one time of a band called Candlemas, um, an album called Ancient Dreams. And this reviewer just trashed the album, just absolutely trashed it. Only the things he said about it, I was like, hey, that sounds like a really good album. So I went and bought it and fell in love with it because yeah. the way he described it. And I thought, well, that's the thing. If it's, you know, if it's something that I describe, then maybe they'll know, okay, I like this thing. That's similar. I'll go get that. So, right. You know, and I will tell you this about uh, people getting back to me on reviews. Some of the people, I've had some other people who have gotten back to me and said, Okay, you said this about it. Now, why was it this? And they'll ask me questions, and then their next album will come out, and they'll send it to me and say, "Now, is this? I tried to fix that. Did it get fixed?" And they've used it constructively, which is what you should do on reviews. If someone writes a, a trash review of yours, you should look at it and honestly, which is hard, but honestly, mm -hmm. ask yourself: Has this person got a point? Right. You know, is this a valid point? And if it is, you should learn from that valid point. Absolutely. And if it's not, if you say, no, that's not a valid point. Like I remember one of the reviews on um, Strange Sound of Cthulhu. One of the reviews on there that I saw, the guy basically said two things. Number one, he said that it wasn't exhaustive because I had missed some bands. And number two, he said, I wish he had asked the band's questions. Well, if he actually read the book, one of the last things I said in there is, look, this isn't an exhaustive list. I've done my best, but I'm sure I missed it. I literally say that in there. And the other thing is every single artist I got hold of, I asked four questions about their, their, uh, how, the, how they got into Lovecraft, what they think they're bringing to uh, – or what Lovecraft brings to the music and how they've reflected that. So I asked the things that he said he wished I had asked them. It's just some of the people I couldn't get in touch with. Uh, Metallica was one of them. I could never get in touch with them. Although I think Cliff Burton was probably the biggest influence on their Lovecraft stuff. And obviously I couldn't get in touch with him. But, um, you know, so it's like this guy didn't read it because I literally addressed both of those things in the book. I don't, I don't get what he was coming from. So it's like I just disregard that review because he obviously didn't know what he was talking about. Um, but if someone has a valid point, there have been things that I've read, and it's like, hey, you know what? I didn't realize that. Going mm -hmm. forward, I'm going to fix that. Right. I've been conscious about it after that. 
you can be cognizant so, of that behavior anyway. Right, right. right. And you've got to you've got to be willing to look at those things and decide. Well, is this a valid thing? And if it is, you you make changes. If you decide you want to, you can say, you know what, it is a valid thing. But this is the way I do it, and that's the way I'm going to continue to do it. But just right. expect that other people are going to bring up that same point again later. Right. Um, but, yeah, so I don't know. We sort of got tra- sidetracked there, but that's kind of what this is all about anyway. So Right. No, I don't think we got I think we're, I think we're, no, I don't think we're sidetracked. We're good. Yeah. So, I don't know. You got anything else you want to? No, I think I think that's good. I just I, I enjoy having these these topical discussions about things like this, because I think very often, again, being a pantser, it's perfect for me because I can just, I, I find all these little rabbit holes and things I don't otherwise think about or things I don't otherwise convey. And I think it seems like you do too. And that's nice. Um, yeah. I, I, I appreciate it for what it is. It's kind of an interesting, I, it's something I never really thought about doing, but I, I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's sort of the collaboration thing, too. You've got different ideas. Um, everybody has different ideas, different ways of doing things. And it's kind of interesting to compare notes. And I hope, you know, for whatever it's worth, I hope that anybody who's thinking about getting into writing or who is working on something for the first time or whatever might get something out of this, too. Um, and that's kind of the part of the point of it. Um Hopefully we can help somebody along the path. And and by all means, feel free to get in touch with me if you ever have questions, anybody out there. Because I'm glad to, you know, give you some advice, give you some ideas. Um, you know, even with Tales of Wonder and Dread, if somebody doesn't feel like doing the full uh, self-publishing themselves and has something that they think would fit, they're welcome to send it. Um, I've actually expected that. I've only had one person who sent something and it didn't really fit with what I wanted to do. And so I turned that person down. But, and also I will say, you know, if you're gonna thinking about doing the self-publishing you can, and you can do it, go ahead and do it. You can probably make more money off of it that way because I'm gonna have to get something out of my work involved. And if you do it yourself, you can take all the money from it, whatever you manage to do. Right. Um, so it makes more sense if you're, to do it yourself if you can. But I'd be very happy to see anything horror or science fiction that people want to send my way, I'd be interested in perhaps publishing something by somebody else. That's nice. You know, something I thought about doing at some point. So yeah, good for you. Yeah. I'm exciting. I'm not that ambitious. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's sort of work to me, but it also isn't. Uh, I don't know. But I know, I'm, I know I'm planning to try to get more books out again this year. Last year was just a disaster when COVID hit. Everything yeah. sort of fell apart, and I understand it. You know, people buy books. It's um, it's sort of uh, you know, money that it, that's um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, discretionary income. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, with the way the economy went, and uh, knowing not knowing whether they're going to have jobs or being out of work, a lot of people were hanging on to their money. It made perfect sense. Oh, absolutely. But I think book sales took a took a hit, and because of that, I didn't publish as much. Although maybe part of why I didn't, you know, sell as many is because I didn't publish as much too. Who knows? But, um, but yeah, I think that maybe this year things are going to start to turn around and it, it'll be a good year to start putting stuff out later in the year. So yeah, that's I'd my really, I'd really like to get back at it. I'd really like to get back at it in earnest, earnest because I miss it. My, my divorce really derailed a lot of things and I, I do miss writing and I find myself I type slower and I find myself thinking less clearly when I'm typing. And so I, I miss that practice. I miss being in, in practice, but yeah, I'd like to get back on that horse. I'd like to put a book out before the end of the year. I don't know that it'll happen, but I'm going to try. You should, um, you should do another Rockford book, Rock, Rockford collaboration book. I, I probably will. Um, I had kind of thought about it as I was getting deeper into the art scene. And then, like, like you said, COVID hit and it just kind of, but yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of people whose brains I really wanted to pick and people who aren't necessarily writers, but I wanted them to write about their experiences. It was your experience as a, as a unique sort of photographer. What are your experiences as, you know, an avant-garde bassist and just hear their stories. Right. I thought it'd be kind of cool to do a, something like that. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. That was next on the agenda, but just never got there. But yeah, it's probably going to happen. Good. Good. Um, because those those things are good, and they are 
I like the Rockford angle to them. You know, my stuff never has a has a local angle really. Well, some of the Rockford music ones in the cemetery books I've done, but and yeah. Berwyn. What's that? And Berwyn. Yeah, Berwyn. Yeah, <laughs> which still going to do spooky Berwyn too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I I don't know if uh, spook the spooky state line and spooky Berwyn two are going to happen this year or next year. Part of the problem with that is I need to go some places and talk to some people and take some photographs. And I'm definitely not comfortable doing that yet. And yeah. Yeah. if I want to do that, I've got to pretty much have that stuff underway by probably late June, if not before then. So I'm, I have a hunch they're going to get pushed back to next year, but we'll see. I'm, I'm sort of waiting to see how the, the pandemic with the vaccines and stuff goes. Um, Cause I'm, I'm very, um, very afraid of catching this thing. Yeah. And so I'm not wanting to take chances. Let's put it that yeah, way. I don't blame you. So I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, um, they could be fun. <laughs> Either way, if they don't happen this year, they're going to happen next September. They'll come out because the first three Tales of Wonder and Dread books were published uh, 2018, I think. Yeah, 2018, then September 4th. So every year on September 4th, I plan to publish at least one or two books from Tales of Wonder and Dread uh, on that date just to kind of keep it alive and, and, and commemorate the anniversary of it. But so I don't know if those would have been coming up this September 4th. If not, it'll be the following September 4th. But, so that's that. Good for you. Yeah. So anything else you want to add, Heath? No, we think we're good. Just probably wrap it okay. up and Take yeah. care of the dog because it sounds like he's he's hovering. Oh no, she's uh, wandering over in the other direction. Diane already took her outside and um, <laughs> walked in and sort of wandering around out there. But um, so it's okay. <laughs> no, you're so. no, if, Gary's dogs are adorable. I can testify to that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. They're yeah, uh, you well and say hi, say hi to Diane. I love you and it's good to see you. All right, great seeing you always, Heath. And one of these days soon, we're going to be getting together in person again. We'll get there. So, all right, take it easy, buddy. Stay safe. Well, bye bye. Bye.